Hi there, I'm Scott Lowe. I'm at Nutanix headquarters today where I'm joined by Lucas Lundell, Director of Solutions and Performance Engineering uh, at, for Nutanix. Yeah. And we're here to talk about the Nutanix architecture, but before we do that, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got here. Yeah. Well, it, it's great to, to speak with you today. I'm really excited to, to talk to you about uh, our architecture today. A um, little bit about how I got here. I was actually a, a consultant um, with uh, Accenture, Accenture's Research and Development Group. And as I was looking at new technologies in the data center space, uh, I came across Nutanix. And uh, with my history in data center architecture and data center build-outs for um, Fortune 100 companies, um, what they were trying to do really rung true for me um, in terms of replacing the SAN um, and moving towards a new architecture for converged storage. It's definitely um, uh, disruptive technology um, and, and incredibly innovative. And I, I really look forward to sharing with, with the folks over there um, basically the, how it works. I mean, let's talk about a little bit of some of the challenges that people face in their data centers and then we'll talk about how you guys, um, how Nutanix directly addresses those problems. Okay, all right, sounds great. Well, um, I actually drew a, a picture here of some of uh, the traditional, uh, what we'd see is a traditional architecture uh, in a VMware deployment in the enterprise. Um, and as you know, um, you, have, you have your servers, you have your storage area network or your 10 gig or one gig network, and then you have your SAN. Um, most arrays that uh, enterprises buy today would be dual controller arrays, right, mm -hmm. with some, some attached disks, usually using a protocol like FCAL on the back end. Um, what we found is that uh, when you're trying to design a solution like this, um, it, it's very difficult because the, the bottleneck in a lot of scenarios um, is the CPU on these storage controllers. Mm -hmm. So as you add more servers to a deployment, um, it's very difficult to know when this is going to reach capacity um, and when this is going to become the bottleneck in, in the deployment. Um, because all of the servers need to send their storage traffic and storage I.O. through the centralized storage. Now, um, so there, there are several issues uh, of, of a traditional deployment. One is the, the controller CPU bottleneck. Mm -hmm. Um, which occurs as you try to add more servers and add more virtual infrastructure to your deployment, um, you run into that issue. Um, and then scalability. When you, when you finally hit that, um, and when you've reached saturation on your storage array, um, in order to scale, you have to buy a new one. It's an entirely new system. You have to buy two new controllers, um, a new NVRAM card, if, if that happens to be in the system as well, and then new disk shells. And it's managed completely separately um, then your first controller. Um, right. so sometimes you have some federated application to help you manage it, but it's really separate infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So that, that's, that's a couple of the problems that we've seen with traditional infrastructure. And there's even more. I mean, if, if there's latency here, because we have the disk that's a, uh, separate from servers, there's additional issues too, and it makes it really hard to plan for a new capacity expansion in, in any way, shape, or form across the environment, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, you have this... You have a, a network, you have fiber channel switches that could be an issue um, or potentially network issues, um, latency of the storage traffic over that uh, shared network, um, and capacity planning, as we talked about. It's, it's very difficult in, with this type of design. So what do you do differently and better to help address some of those challenges that we see on the, on the, on the screen here? Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, we get rid of the centralized storage controller. Um, and we do that through the intelligence of software. So we believe that this problem in particular can be solved not by having a centralized storage array, which is a hardware entity, but by building the intelligence of centralized storage in a distributed system. We get rid of that too. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, um, so now we have... Uh, Nutanix architecture. Okay. And uh, in a Nutanix architecture, um, we actually don't have just two controllers. Um, we have one virtual storage controller on every node in our cluster or in our system. Now, some people think that th this is basically a VSA. And, and they, they deride the solution a little bit because they go, well, they got to, they, they have to, the VSA is a crutch, but that's not really true. And can you explain that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, VSAs to some extent, it, 
to some degree, it does look like a VSA. Right. I mean, it, it looks, it's a, it's a virtualized storage controller. Right. But that's where the similarities end. Um, most of the VSAs were designed, the initial set of VSAs that were out in the market were designed for small and medium businesses. They did not have the same level of intelligence that you would find in a centralized storage array. Um, the Nutanix uh, solution has all of the intelligence and all of the features that you would expect with some of the leading centralized storage arrays, such as automated tiering, data locality. So mm -hmm. the VSAs that you mentioned, they don't have this concept of uh, VM data locality, where a VM talking to this uh, you know, virtualized storage controller, in, in that situation, um, the data is going to be local. Right. Whereas with the, some of the traditional VSAs that you're mentioning, that's that's not the case. Could at be all. across the network, which introduces those latency issues once again. Exactly. In the yeah. environment as well as additional complexity. Yeah, absolutely. So we have a, a controller VM basically, and what about the storage? Where's that now? So instead of using a, a bunch of disk shells on the back end of a, a storage controller, actually our storage controller is directly attached to all of the disks, and we we use locally attached disks on every one of these servers. So we have. Uh, both SSDs, mm -hmm. so both flash, and we use the Intel S3700 okay. SSD drives, which are an, an enterprise class SSD drive. And then we also have 7200 RPM HDDs on the system. So every one of these systems has two SSDs. Okay, so we have two, four HDDs. Um, two ultra fast SSDs, right? Yep. I just want to try because I want everybody to see it here. Because yeah. it's a good stuff. And uh, we have four. HDD. So the basically, this is going to give you some performance. This will give you capacity. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So, how are you maximizing the storage the storage performance potential here? I mean, are you using these these disks as a tier, as a cache? I mean, how is that happening? Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, so what we do is we have three level three levels. So on the read side, we have three levels of cache. We have an in-memory cache mm -hmm. within every server, um, and then we have a hot tier. Um, which is the SSD flash, um, and then we have the cold tier, which is you know data that's not being read or written frequently is actually stored on the slowest tier of storage. Okay. So it is it it has auto tiering built in. So it's something that the customer doesn't even need to worry about. Right. Um, it's automatically done based on data access patterns. Um, you can pin certain VMs in flash um, or create a storage pool that's only flash based for your your most critical VMs as well. Okay, so the user gets a choice about where they want to run their run their data. Yeah, exactly. But run their workloads. But normally, what we like to do is just let let the system decide. It has the intelligence to to understand what's the best data to keep in the hottest tier. So it's basically, there's auto tiering, so the user can sort of take a set it and forget it approach to the appliance. Exactly. Yeah. And this really is an system. appliance. I mean, it's if this is a node that we're looking at right here, and if you look at you know the, the appliance, there's four of these nodes in a single two-year chassis, right? Yep. Correct. So. All of this that you see here is actually contained in a 2U chassis. So every um, 2U chassis that we have has four nodes. And each one of those nodes is entirely independent. Um, it has its own set of locally attached storage. Um, and it has its own storage controller. And these storage controllers actually communicate with each other um, to form the Nutanix distributed file system. And the reason that they need to do that is for purposes like a high availability. Mm -hmm. um, so say we have some sort of failure with one of these uh, nodes. Mm -hmm. um, actually, on every write that's done from a user VM to one of these local devices, we'll repli replicate it synchronously to another one of the servers in the solution, or one of the, another one of the Nutanix nodes in the solution. So every single write is replicated, and it's actually done in, a, in an area that we call oplog. So every write is written to flash um, on one of the devices, on one mm -hmm. of the servers, and then we replicate it to the flash device of another server as well. And it could be anywhere in the system. Okay, so even anywhere in the cluster, it doesn't have to be in one, in, in this 2U um, construct here, it could be across any of the up to, how many nodes do you support in the cluster right now? Yeah, how we, we actually don't even have an upper limit okay. on the number of nodes that we've determined. So that's a very good point. It's uh, as you, as you indicated, it's a scale-out file system. Right. So you can start with four nodes, and then as you require more storage or compute capacity, you can simply add one node at a time according to your requirements. 
So in, in the old model where we had to buy an entire SAM mm -hmm. at, you know, two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars $300,000. Right. With our model, you can buy a node at, you know, one quarter of the price or even, you know, one eighth of the price. And that becomes your unit of scale. When I buy a node, a new node, after, let's say I've got this thing built and I want to add a node. What's the, how hard is it to add a new node to the system? It, it's incredibly easy. So it's actually just a couple clicks within our UI. Um, you put the node in the system, you rack and stack it, you cable it up to the 10 gig network. Mm -hmm. So all of these are connected just by a normal 10 gig switch. Okay. Um, it's auto discovered in the system. So Use, how does it auto discover? Um, it uses a protocol called Avahi. Okay. Um, so it's the same protocol that like your iPhone, um, it's, it's, a, it's a public version of the Bonjour protocol okay. that Apple uses. Um, so the name of the protocol is Avahi and it runs on top of IPv6. Okay. Um, now what about, you know, data reliability? I mean, that's a really big issue for people, especially when you start scaling to huge numbers. I mean, we want to make sure that our data is safe. What do you guys do to make sure that my data is safe in, in, inside this cluster? Absolutely. So uh, all the data we have is 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 obviously checksum. So um, we make sure that it's that that it has both integrity um, and reliability. So reliability, um, what we talked about a little bit is any write is replicated somewhere else in the cluster. Now, what's also interesting. So say I have a write here. You know, I have some piece of data here. It's also here. So I can support this node failing because every other controller in the cluster. If the VM, so in this scenario, let's say the server failed, um, these VMs obviously need to, to do an HA event. So use something like VMware HA mm -hmm. to fail over to another node. So, so on another node, I, one, of this, one of these VMs uh, starts up, right, through VMware HA. And it Obviously, the data there is gone, but it still has a copy of the data that it can get to and through the distributed system. So we use remote procedure calls, actually Google protobufs on the back end to make sure that a VM can get to whatever data it needs. Um, what's interesting also is that we, ha we auto heal. So once a single node in the system fails, we understand and we see that there's only one copy of data. And we actually do MapReduce and use, use um, uh, MapReduce and mm -hmm. those types of analytics to figure out, okay, I, I only have one copy of this particular piece of data. Um, and when we see that, we'll replicate it again to another node in the cluster. So the, the, the customer, only for the period of time it takes to discover that, the, that there's, missing, there's a missing replica, and that it recreates that replica somewhere else, that's the only time that the customer's potentially ever at risk, and they really still have to copy their data. Correct. And yep, that's right. Is, is and that then we can tolerate another failure after that. Is yep. that replication parameter tunable? So I, can I say I want three copies of my data? Actually, in the latest release, it is. Okay. Um, so we're, we're releasing RF3 mm -hmm. in our release, which I believe is in, in April. So um, what, we, what we call RF2, RF3. Um, so RF2 is I want two replicas of data. Okay. RF3 is I want three replicas. So when you have three replicas, you can actually tolerate two failures. Right. So that's, that's a very important point. So for bigger clusters, that, that's what we actually recommend. Lucas, this has been a great look at a sort of the problem that Nathanus is trying to solve in the architecture. I really appreciate your time. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very, thank much, you very much for meeting with me today. And absolutely. Uh, glad to talk about Nutanix. And thank you for watching and look forward for, uh, to more videos. Thank you very much.